Good afternoon, and we are live from COP26 in Glasgow. My name is Nadia Rosli. I am project director with Internews in Malaysia and a freelance environmental journalist. This is our fourth uh, of our live broadcast. And this is something that the Earth Journalism Network, or EGN, a project of Internews, and the Stanley Center for Peace and Security, where they have brought 22 journalists from developing countries to cover the 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties of COP26 as part of the Climate Change Media Partnership Program, or CCMP. This is an annual fellowship to the Climate Change Conference, which started in 2007. CCMP organizers believe that it is critical for journalists from low and middle income countries to have the opportunity to report live from COP26. With the onset of COVID, it has been more difficult than ever for journalists to attend because of travel restrictions. Thus, we hope this broadcast helped journalists covering COP26 remotely and serve as a resource. From November 8th until November 13th, we will host this broadcast for half an hour in which every day we will touch on a different theme. We will feature three speakers, a trainer and a fellow from the CCMP program and an external speaker. And today's theme is linking local to global policies and commitments. So what comes next now that pledges have been announced at COP26 and reports have been published? How can journalists translate high level or global commitments to localized targets and solutions? And what kind of local stories can we tell from global climate science? To speak more on today's theme are our three guests. The first is Imelda Abano, Internews Earth Journalism Network, Philippines and Pacific Coordinator and founding president of the Philippine Network of Environmental Journalists. Emelda is the contributing editor for Munga Bay Enviro News Philippines. She's an award-winning journalist and media trainer from the Philippines who covers climate change, biodiversity, algae culture, energy, and other environment-related issues. Uh, she, she is also from, she is also founding president of the Philippine Network of Environmental Journalists, an organization which aims to empower and enable local journalists to improve the quality of environmental and climate change reporting in her country. Welcome today, Imelda. Welcome. Thank so you. Imelda, I think uh, you first covered COP more than a decade ago, I believe. Um, can you share your experience of attending this conference for the first time as a CCMP fellow? And how did this transform your career as an environmental journalist? Thanks for that, Nadia. And uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I've been writing um, environment and climate-related issues for the past 15 years. And um, surprisingly, I made the first cut for the CCMP uh, first batch in 2007. So I was very young then and uh, energetic, and I want to cover everything. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's really very overwhelming if it's your first time to, um, to, to attend uh, uh, or cover uh, um, international conference like that, because it will be overwhelming, um, I think. Um, but in that coverage, I learned many things, like you have to read, 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 really uh, prepare yourselves, uh, read more backgrounds, um, and connect with your um, delegation. And since then, you know, you've established the Philippine Network of Environmental Journalists, and you have co-authored a guideline on climate change for Philippine journalists as well. So mm -hmm. what kind of developments in the newsroom as well as in the ecosystem of uh, media in the Philippines, where you've actually observed coverage on this topic, has there been uh, you know, better communication of uh, more technical topics, especially to a non-specialist audience in your country? Yeah, uh, I think that's true. Um, in terms of climate change reporting, I think in the Philippines, um, uh, in particular, um, there is an increasing, um, uh, increasing um, uh, way, or let's say, um, the more journalists wanted to cover or report more on climate change issues, and um, with the uh, skills that we've gained throughout the years and strengthening our skills. And uh, of course, with the help of the um, Indigenous Earth Journalism Network, um, we've uh, uh, held a lot of workshops with, um, with local journalists. And most of them are now um, um, writing on environment or on climate change related uh, stories. And they have collaborated with um, scientists, policymakers, 
um, so that they can understand more local issues uh, apart from the global issues. And I think it's very effective for them. Uh, um, we can see that in their report. So what kind of role do you think journalists, especially from developing, uh, developing countries, play in climate change reporting because they are in the front lines of this climate crisis and experiencing the impacts firsthand? So do you think is it enough for, for these journalists to cover these stories or do you think they also have a role to influence decision making and mobilize um, public action? Um, I, I think it's not just on reporting, but um, our important role is to influence policymakers. To, to, to make, for instance, um, our community resilient, um, to plan ahead, to restore, and uh, to, to, uh, to push more um, the government in, uh, in the well-being of the community. And what kind of leads are you following here at COP26 for your own climate change reporting? Yeah, at COP26, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, sticky issues here, but um, the the coverage uh, or the the real issue is not in the four corners of this um uh of this uh venue it is in the in our uh in our communities in the in our countries so i think we need to push more on for example on finance uh, mitigation adaptation issues and of course highlight the un phase of climate change thank you so much Imelda. thank you thank you if you have any questions for any of our speakers, uh, please put them into the chat zoom box, uh, chat zoom, and we will address them to them later. Uh, our second speaker is Alfreda Kevin Alerici, who is a multimedia journalist who covers and reports human interest stories and a reporter for People's Gazette Nigeria. She has exposed several corrupt practices, including pollution by oil multinational companies in Nigeria, illegal fishing by Chinese vessels on Nigeria and Ghana waters illicit flow of small weapons and light arms, as well as sales of expired product in Nigeria by big superstars amid COVID-19. Uh, she is here as also a fellow at, for the CCMP program. And welcome to the live broadcast. Thank you. So maybe I should start with asking you, since you are an investigative journalist and you are here for your first crop, on what kind of leads are you pursuing? And are you finding new sources for maybe an ongoing story that you are working back home? Okay, thank you for that question. So this is my first call and I'm so, so excited about it. And talking about the lead and for sure, and you agree with me that investigative pieces are not what will come to the public and discover, but I'm certainly doing a whole lot of things that I've lined up, that are lined up for my diary. And also the, this fellowship is one fellowship that has exposed me. Honestly, it has exposed me it has exposed my, my knowledge, giving me a broader sense of what is happening across Africa, not just Nigeria and our neighbor Ghana. That opportunity, like going to Congo, discussing with people, the, the Côte d'Ivoire, et cetera. So the pieces I'm putting up are something that will come, although I've released some good ones, but I'm still uh, putting out uh, writings more that have not been published yet. Hopefully, even after the COP, I'll still be putting out something else. Thank you. That's great to hear. Um, so, but have you also been able to track your national delegates or representatives here at COP26? And how is their interaction with you as a local journalist here at an international event? Are they more helpful to provide information or are they actually avoiding you? Honestly, I'm not happy about it. I'll just say it boldly and clearly. I'm not really happy about the way our, our and delegates here in Nigeria are treating me. And I'm certain that it's not just me, other journalists who might be having similar issues. So for instance, when I go to places like, like the, the Côte d'Ivoire, the uh, Sierra Leone, the, uh, the uh, other, other African countries, when you go to their pavilion, they are there to discuss with you. And even if they are not there, the front desk officer will tell you when to come without even obstructing you or giving you problem. But when you go to, when I, when I go to Nigerian pavilion, you have a series of excuses. Probably they brought up, um, I don't know what, what it came, what, what their own idea is. For instance, I give you, I tell you yesterday what happened. Because I've been going there several, several, and by the time yesterday when I got there, I met the front there. I told him, this is what I want to do. Can you help me out? Can you reach out to the person in charge? I said, okay, so we have somebody there, the director of climate change. I said, okay, please, can you just meet her? Even if she won't talk, tell her I'm around, let her tell me where to go, or just tell her that somebody's around, I will, will get a response. He said, no, that I need to stand outside too. Whenever she comes out, I said, it doesn't work like that. So I was angry and I told him that this is not how other people have been treating us. Well, when I go there, they, they discuss with me. By the time I voiced out my anger, he said, oh, hold on. 
he called somebody to go in there and um, tell the woman that the journalist is, yeah, is, is, is in there waiting for, is outside waiting for her. The man got there and the woman was very happy to see me. So what this means is that it might be that people on the front, they, they don't want us to see our people. I don't know if they gave them instruction. I really do not know about that. So when she saw me, she told me, okay, I'm not in the position. She gave me names to talk to. And good enough, the, the guy, she, the, the, the uh, officer or the, the staff of the Ministry of Health took me around, but the people are not there. And one of the person that was willing, that, that they said, hey, this person is actually fit to talk. So what I did is that, Yesterday, that was the day first day. I spoke to the commission, the, the minister of environment, the state minister of environment. Minister, now she, I just when I was coming this morning, she saw my WhatsApp and uh, gave me a number to speak with. And I went straight to the woman and she said, the, the, the person she gave me the contact said, okay, I'll speak to you, but I need to confirm from her. I'm good enough. She just giving me time. Maybe I stepped in, she just gave me time that, okay, I'm agreed, I've agreed, I've confirmed from Madam, I've agreed, consensual period. So I hope. Yeah, actually answer my question. That would be a good one. That's the only problem I have. Yes, nothing more. So I think we can agree that COP, you know, that the COP always, um, I guess, helps you build uh, skills to be more resourceful and also to experience some of the challenges that I think also other journalists are experiencing. Um, but maybe you can elaborate on some of the pledges by your national government here, which fits into the uh, national climate change debate back home. And is the public following what's happening here in Glasgow? And what are you doing as a journalist to ensure that authorities are accountable for what's happening here and the pledges that they, they are making here? Oh, that's a good question. So talking about um, if, our country, if people are following what is happening, of course, they are following what is happening in Glasgow. And in as much as we don't have information or I don't have a particular information I need there, but if you have sent out, somebody, someone called me from, as we are in, as we are in Glasgow now, there's this pollution that happened in Bias. And, it's, and it's somebody called me and said, I feel that you're in class, you're in Glasgow. I know our, our, our state government will come in. Can you ask them this question? What are they doing about pollution? This thing happened. Even on the fourth, something, the same thing, gas leakage happened. And what are, what are they doing? Can you ask them? So it means that with my, my sources and my uh, followers on Twitter or social media, they are abreast of what is happening. Even though not, or, but the least, the, the little they could get from, 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 from my publication and other media organizations, I think. They are, they are actually following up. I think that's really interesting that you know mm. people are following your yes, kind of yes. But here. Let me, yeah. I think I need to ask something to talking about also the NDCs looking at it from the local aspect. So I was opportune to be where the uh, the the government was actually launching the arrow the red plus. So the red plus is looking at the reducing emission from deforestation and uh, forest degradation. So they've launched this project. I had, I, had, I had the opportunity to interview the director, and he told me that the, the government of Nigeria has actually brought out this plan. Yeah, they plan how to how to reduce the frustration in Nigeria and the steps they need to go so that if donors or uh, country donor countries are coming or NGO want to work with them, partner with them, they have already seen the plan that this is what we want to do, and see you 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 can help us. And and very very something that that I didn't go down well with me was that. You know, in Nigeria, we have about 30, we have 36 states in Nigeria plus the FCT. Now, only seven states, according to what you told me, that only seven states was able to, um, uh, was or agreed to be part of this red program. So what happened to other states? Now, statistics actually shows that like between 20 and 2005 to about 2012, I'm not mistaken, that uh, more than, for the Nigeria lost about between 350 to 400,000 acres due to this issue. So what happened to other states are not part of it? Why are they not part of it? But this is something that I need to look further, even after COP. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Alfreda. So we hope that you will continue to pursue very important stories beyond COP26. Um, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Next, we will have Jonathan Lin, who is the Head of Communications and Media Relations at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or ITCC. Before joining the IPCC in November 2011, he worked as a foreign correspondent and editor for Reuters news agency for 32 years, reporting from over 30 countries around the world. Jonathan has an MA from Cambridge University, where he studied modern languages at Clare College. He is fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. And from December 2021, he will be senior communications advisor at the IPCC. Welcome to our live broadcast. Thank you, Nadia. Hello, everyone. So I think, um, you know, it is quite a feat for journalists to understand the IPCC, IPCC report as well as the organization itself. So maybe you could start by 
briefly explaining what is the role of IPCC and the functioning of the IPCC? Yeah, th thank you for the opportunity to explain that. So the IPCC, the in Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, its job, or our, our job, is to look at all the scientific research that's produced every year about anything to do with climate change, look at it all, and then tell governments, also citizens, but mainly governments, this is what the scientific community knows about climate change. So we don't do our own research, but we look at all the other research that's been published and say, here's the state of knowledge. This is what we know, this is what we don't know, this is what, where more work needs to be done. And this is done by, um, we're an organization of governments, it's the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, so 195 member governments. They elect a Bureau of Scientists and they convene the scientific community to write these big reports um, that, that assess uh, scientific knowledge about uh, climate change. And all those people who work on it, the, the, the bureau members, the, the authors of the reports, they all do it as volunteers in their own time on top of their day jobs. So the IPCC report is considered as the world's most reliable source on the state, on, on, on the state of knowledge on climate change. So can you explain like who actually endorses it and who trusts this to, to actually, um, you know, where people collectively agree that this is the most reliable uh, source of yeah. Yeah, thank you. And this is a really good and important question. Because as I said, the, the IPCC, it's an organization of governments, and they bring the scientific community together to work to work for them. And so what happens is governments ask the IP, I, IPCC scientists to prepare a report. They set, the, they set the outline of the report and the advice of the scientists. And at various stages, they help the scientists make sure that it's going to be something that's useful for them in policy making and at the end we have uh, an approval process where the, the government representatives and the scientists come together in a dialogue to make sure the summary for policy makers is a is a good accurate uh, report it's a good reflection of the main report and it's something that governments can work with as they try to address climate change and it's that combination of the the two the two parts, the, the politicians, the governments, and the scientists that makes it so strong. And every one of our reports is endorsed by our governments. We work by consensus. So all 195 governments endorse our reports. But in the discussions that they have with the governments, the scientists have the last word. So I think it was hard to miss the headlines when the latest IPCC report came out when you know, a lot of newsrooms published the Code Red for Humanity. Um, and I think a lot of media picked up, um, you know, the, the report, the findings from the report, and it was the key headline, but this, this interest uh, soon dwindled, I think, in the, in the few weeks after the report was published. So what are some of the key themes and topics that local, local journalists should pay attention to so that the climate crisis continues to get coverage? What are some of the IPCC findings that they should pay attention to, um, you know, in the next upcoming one? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not sure that the interest has dwindled that much. I mean, it was massive on the day the report came out, but we're still getting requests for interviews and information about that report. It's really, I think it's really transformed the way people think and about climate change and the whole awareness of it. But yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And what, what should people be focusing on, on now? And um, I mean, generally with climate change, it's very important to, not to try and play down the gravity and the seriousness of the problem and the urgency for need of action. This is really, you know, they're great. It's very dangerous and it really risks all our, our communities and societies. But at the same time, we, we mustn't just focus on the doom and gloom. It's very important to report on how communities and people are coming together, how they're empowering themselves to take action and, and find, find ways of, of building resilient communities and and um, addressing the problem. So there's a new focus on regional information and data in this year's um, report. So how will this new direction help journalists turn global um, climate science into local stories? Yeah, well, this, this, this uh, latest report that came out had a number of innovations. And one of them was a big focus on regional information. Because as I said, we, we, we do our reports, they're not done as a kind of scientific ivory tower exercise. They're meant to be very practical, practical, actionable uh, reports that, that governments can use. And um, the, if you, in the past, we've, there's been more of a focus on global information, which is very important because that provides the context for everything. But really it's at the regional level that it becomes relevant to policymakers. So we've had a big 
efforts to provide to make regional information available and that happens in two two principal ways so firstly apart apart from the chapters about it about information firstly there's the we've introduced a new thing called the interactive atlas we've brought all that information and data together and you can go online onto our onto our website and choose choose a region and see how putting different different parameters in like different different emissions how that's going to affect temperature and precipitation and other climate climate factors so it's a very useful tool both for policymakers and in, in the region who are trying to plan and make, make their communities resilient but also also for journalists researching stories and then we've taken some of the information from that and produced a series of regional fact sheets which again you can find on our on our on our website and i think those are a great great resource for for journalists one of our problems in the ipcc has been we we we, we want to communicate more with with people in, in in developing countries the media in developing countries we're very grateful to you for giving us the opportunity to talk today and this is a really great resource for media in developing countries as it covers all all regions of the world uh, thanks jonathan for some of the tips earlier but having said that um what do you feel are also certain things that uh journalists should avoid doing when they're actually you know um taking some of the ipcc findings and you know translating them into local stories uh, what are maybe some of the things you've observed in terms of what uh, journalists should avoid in terms of that yeah that's also a good a very good question so i mean one one of them i guess it applies to any kind of journalism where you're dealing with some kind of specialist topic right so our, our world is full of abbreviations and acronyms and things and um okay when we work inside it all day long we know what they mean but people in the outside world don't and it's very easy if you're a journalist covering this you start to get used to all this weird terminology we use but remember your readers won't know what it means you have to explain things so every abbreviation you come across spell it out and even some of the terminology you think okay i know what this means because i've done a bit of work and preparing for a story but do my readers know what this means we actually had some scientific surveys done to help us uh, prepare our reports we asked about some this was and we used just actually it was wasn't a global survey it was only in the united states but we asked what how people understand certain key terms so that we could make sure we're using them efficiently in our reports one of them i mean everyone here talks about adaptation right adaptation which is how 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 we and and how nature wildlife can adjust to the changes in the climate that are already happening so it's a common term here there's an adaptation committee there are discussions about all the time but if you ask people in the outside world what do you understand by adaptation they think it's it's about turning a book into a movie that's the response you get they don't know but it's to do with it. so even a term like that which we all think is fundamental to discussion you've got to you've got to make a point of explaining it, let alone things like mitigation and, and, and so on and so on so that's that's very important um i guess another thing is again like like anything don't, don't don't take it all for granted now i think you, you you can rely on the ipcc we have a very good process for ensuring things are balanced and objective and so on but sometimes you'll hear maybe somebody is saying the science it's not really true and, and uh that here's a scientist who's disproved it all and uh or here's somebody who's proved that there's that governments are lobbying the ipcc to undermine the strength of the findings and so on okay sure check out check out those stories by all means but don't just take them at face value check check your other sources to see whether there really is something behind it or whether it's just somebody pushing something at you because we see again and again people are trying to distort the findings um and to, to push a certain view and you have to be have to be careful where you're getting your, your information from thank you that was really helpful um and it's a good reminder as well to journalists to ensure that they're always covering um you know scientific topics uh well and also objectively um do we have any questions from from the audience oh uh, yes we have a few okay thank you so um this is for you jonathan so thank what you. is your impression of cop 26 so far um, and do you think that parties are taking enough actions to to respond to the key findings of IPCC? Aha, uh -huh. well, that's a very <laughs> difficult question for me to answer because we're we're not we're not actually part of the negotiations. We're um, we're my badge says UN observer, so we're here to help the negotiations. But we're actually not we're not really supposed to comment 
on what the governments are doing. Remember, we're an organization of governments. So if I say, well, they're not doing a very good job of this, but this one was great, then some of our governments are going to be rather upset to them. So but what I do see is again and again, which is very encouraging, again and again, I see people referring to the IPCC reports and, and, and other scientific information. And I can see that they're, they're taking that seriously and that the negotiations are, are taking that into account. And we, I mean, that's the reason we're here. And at the, it's not just that we give presentations and official presentation the report. At the beginning of, the, of last week, there was a process called the, the Structured Expert Dialogue, where, where the governments are able to ask and negotiators are able to ask very detailed questions to IPCC experts who are there so that the, the negotiators can really get to the bottom of the report and make sure they understand it so that they, they, they have no excuse then. They, the negotiations can be based on, on solid science. Okay, um, we have another question. So do you have any suggestions on story ideas that journalists should explore following COP26? Okay, well, um, I guess, uh, I mean, it's not really an IPCC thing, but if I was, a, and I was a journalist, I guess one thing I'd want to follow up is people are making pledges and promises here. You can see that it's in the, it's, it's, it's announced, it's reported, it's in the news. So are they, what, what, what happens with those afterwards? Do, are, they, are they following up with them? Is that happening at the, at the national level? Is that happening at the global level? So you can talk to, talk to your governments, talk to, to NGOs, civil society organizations to see, well, there was all, all this stuff was talked about here, looks good, what, what's actually uh, happening with it? I think we can take uh, one final question for Jonathan. So what's next for IPCC? Um, what can we expect from the next report? Right, okay. Well, um, we, we've just come out with this, this report in, uh, in August, three months ago. That's the first part of a series of reports. And we, we always work this way. The whole thing is called the sixth assessment report. And we have the first part. The second part is coming at the end of, end of February, beginning of March. There'll be, it will be on impacts so how the climate changes that we heard about in the report in August, how are those impacting um, us, humans, society, and wildlife and agriculture? What's that doing to us? And how are we and wildlife adjusting to all those changes? So impacts and adaptation. And then about a month later, there'll be another report on mitigation. And mitigation is, okay, we know from the first report the climate's changing. And we know why it's because of emissions of, of greenhouse gases from human activity so what can we do to stop that happening in the future stop climate change getting completely uh, at the state where we can't can't even adjust and adapt to it anymore so those are the next two reports and then in september we do another report which integrates all those three into one high, high level document so journalists we have some busy months yeah. ahead so please keep an eye out for the subsequent ipcc reports as uh, jonathan has mentioned thank you so much for thank, you, Nadia. thank you so thank you so much for joining us today we still have two more live broadcasts that will happen uh, tomorrow and on saturday and if you would like to find out more about news from coming up from cop 26 or some of the resources that you may use as a journalist uh, please log on to egn's website at www Oh, sorry. Sorry. So if you would like to, uh, to check out more resources, you can head on to the website at, at earthjournalism.net slash COP26. And we also have slides from Jonathan, uh, which has been uploaded onto the website and it is under IPCC presentation by Jonathan Lin. So tomorrow's theme will be gender and climate, uh, climate justice. And our speakers will be Mildred Mulenga from Zambia, Maria Monica Monsalve Sanchez from Colombia and an external speaker. So thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you again tomorrow. Please stay safe.